Why is weight loss so dang difficult? Or I guess I should say, why is permanent long-term weight loss and weight management so dang difficult? Maybe you can relate to this. You go on a diet and you lose some weight and now you're feeling good and you're looking good. But somehow six, maybe 12 months later, you're right back to your pre-diet weight. What the heck happened? So you start the process all over again, but this time you pick a different diet and you double down on getting your cardio in and it works. You lose some weight and you start feeling good and looking good again. But those lost pounds insidiously sneak back onto your body. Only this time they're joined by a few extra pounds. It's as if those hard lost pounds made some new friends while they were away and invited them back to your place for a party. Perhaps the problem has to do with our assumptions about how we lose weight and maintain a healthy body composition over the long haul. Maybe it's time to re-examine the common advice of eat less and exercise more and come up with a more sustainable model that works for those of us over 50. Maybe it's time for a revolution. Welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Show. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach, and my mission is to help you get into the best shape of your life, no matter your age, so you can show up in the second half of your life as the healthiest, strongest, most vital version of yourself. We have a great show for you today. Sal Stefano is here, and he's going to help us get off the diet and exercise hamster wheel and help us get healthy and fit and stay that way for life. But before we get to today's episode, I want to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by MAPS Fitness Programs. If you're hitting the gym but not following a professional, well-thought-out program, maybe you're just following something you saw online, then these programs are definitely for you. There is a MAPS program for everybody, no matter what your goal is, from the complete newbie to the advanced athlete. And I want to let you know that all month long in June, they are running two 50% off promos. The first is the MAPS Shredded Summer Bundle. This bundle comes with four programs. The first is the MAPS Aesthetic, which is a 12-week full-body muscle-building program designed to sculpt your body. The second is MAPS HIT, which is a high-intensity interval training program designed for rapid fat loss and total fitness conditioning. The third program in this bundle is MAPS Prime, which helps us identify and fortify mobility weaknesses, certainly something those of us over 50 should be focusing on. And the final product included in this bundle is the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. This is a guide designed to help you make better eating decisions and improve your relationship with food. Now, if you're not ready to invest in the full bundle and you just want to try out one of their products, the MAPS HIT program is also on sale for 50% off this month. If you're interested in learning more, head over to silveredgepartners.com and click on the MAPS Fitness Products icon and make sure you use the coupon code JUNE50 at checkout for your 50% discount. Again, that's silveredgepartners.com and use the coupon code JUNE50. That's JUNE50 all run together for your 50% discount off of these two products. Okay, enough of that. Let's get on with today's show. today is Sal Stefano. Sal is one of the most sought after experts in the health and fitness industry. He's a founding member and host of the wildly popular podcast Mind Pump, which is my personal favorite podcast. And he is also the author of the new book titled The Resistance Revolution, the no cardio way to burn fat and age proof your body in only 60 minutes a week. I started our interview by asking Sal how he got interested in health and wellness. I started quite young, so I started personally at the age of 14 and just totally fell in love with the empowering aspects of uh, of fitness. You know, I found something that I could, you know, do for myself and I saw some real positive impacts. Totally fell in love with it, became a nerd about the whole thing and read every book I could. Um, I would go to the library and and read studies. I mean, this was as a kid, so my mom was a little worried actually (laughs) about how much time I spent on this uh, this topic or or this, uh, this field, but I absolutely loved it. As soon as I turned 18... I was old enough to become a personal trainer and became a trainer at the local 24-hour fitness. 
and very quickly moved up the ranks. Within a few months, I was managing the fitness department. And by the time I was 19, I was managing big box gyms and grand opening health clubs and doing the whole thing. I did that for a little while. At the age of uh, 23, I opened my own wellness facility. So I had a small studio that had personal training, massage therapy, acupuncture, hormone testing, gut testing, and some nutrition services. And the goal was really to, at this point in my career, at, you know, at the age of 23, I was, I was really good about exercise. I understood exercise technique, biomechanics. I understood nutrition from a fat loss uh, perspective, but I was still quite green when it came to total health. And I identified that there was value in other modalities in the space, which is why I had all those other people working in my facility. And I did that for over a decade. Learned a lot from the incredible people I got to work with. I learned a lot about correctional exercise from physical therapists that worked in there. Learned about Eastern medicine practices and its value with the acupuncturists. And learned a lot about gut testing and hormone testing, you know, the effects of, of stress and sleep on health. And it really made me much more well-rounded, at least to the point where I understood that health was multidimensional. And I really honed in on trying to perfect the application of fitness and health from the perspective of forever or for, in the context of forever. Meaning I had identified probably five years into my career, maybe less, that losing weight um, and getting in shape was not the problem. It was staying in that, in that state, right? How do, you know, millions of people lose weight every year, but the vast majority, it's you know, north of 85%, gain it back in a very short period of time. And if, I think if you extend that timeline out long enough, you'll see it's closer to 95%. And so I, I really tried to figure out that problem. It's like, okay, how can we keep people here? What can we do to, to, to get them to maintain this a good relationship with exercise and nutrition? That's what I focused my career for for that entire time. And I figured a few things out. While I did that, I, I one of my clients, who's now the producer of Mind Pump, Doug, he approached me and asked me if I ever wanted to put something together to promote online because he had some online marketing experience. And so together we created the first MAPS workout program, which we, we now have many of them through Mind Pump. And then through that process, I connected with my co-hosts, Adam and Justin. And we started the Mind Pump podcast about seven and a half years ago. And really with the same goal that I had when I started as a trainer, which was to just help as many people as possible and to really solve this, this problem, this health issue that these chronic health issues that plague modern um, societies. And, you know, with a podcast, it, it, we were able to reach more people. And what you heard on the show early days was were three hosts with no media experience whatsoever. So it's very, very rough and, and raw. But what we did have was the experience of communicating. So my co-hosts, Adam and Justin, also very experienced in the, in the health space, similar paths and very similar passion for helping people. And, you know, there's, what do they say? There's uh, many paths, you know, go up to the top of the mountain, I guess, something along those lines. So all of us through seeking, trying to figure out how to solve this issue came to a lot of the same conclusions. And when we met, we decided to start a podcast. It would reach a lot of people. And we thought it could make a big impact. And then who knows, maybe it would turn into something real big. Well, it did. It resonated with a lot of people, even those early days when we were terrible on the podcast. And uh, about a year in, we did it full time. Uh, and that's what I do now. I've, I've mainly host the podcast. We have other media channels trying to use new media to reach as many people as possible to counter the poor messaging and bad information that really is uh, dominant in the in the fitness, health, and diet space. The goal is to try to sell uh, the right information better than they sell the wrong information, which is, believe it or not, I mean, that's no easy feat. You know, I'm competing with someone who says, you know, take this diet pill or, you know, yeah, follow yeah. this diet and lose 30 pounds in 30 days. And here I am saying, you know, if you do this right, it'll take you a year and you have to change behaviors and do all this other stuff. So it's it's not easy, but I think we're making some headway. The show's quite large now. I, I start to see I'm starting to see a lot of coaches and trainers start to change their messaging, and I, I feel like we've influenced that somewhat. You certainly have. I'll, I'll jump in here real quick and just say my listeners probably have heard me say before, Mind Pump is my favorite podcast, right? So when I found you guys, it was refreshing because it was 
counter to a lot of what we see in the fitness space, right? And I think I read somewhere that your mission early on was to shift the direction of our fitness industry from this aesthetic sort of insecurity-based industry or fear-based industry or guilt-based industry more to one of self-love and self-care, right? You guys certainly have made a big impact in that way. And yeah, and, yeah no, no, a hundred percent. I, you know, the, 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 fi- and you know, the fitness industry, like any industry, an industry that, that in order for it to continue to operate, it has to generate revenue, right? So for people to continue to produce content and products and workouts and exercise equipment and gyms and all that stuff, they obviously have to produce revenue in order to make that happen. It is an industry after all. And that's not necessarily, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong about that. But what it does do, especially when an industry is new, which the fitness industry at large is relatively new. It hasn't been around like the food industry has for 100 years, but we can get to that as well. It's been around for at large maybe 30 years and really only really gotten really massive for the last maybe couple decades, you know, since the 90s. And the problem is, is that it's really easy to sell products through encouraging people to hate themselves, right? Yeah, through yeah. talking to their insecurities. In fact, you'll hear people talk about this when they're teaching, you know, how to sell a product. They'll say, you know, find the pain points in people and, and focus on that, right? Because that gets people to, to make a decision. Well, the pain points with people when they're thinking about doing something about their health typically revolve around feeling inadequate, insecure, ugly, you know, fat, skinny, you know, you name it, right? So it's this kind of negative, you know, mindset. And so the fitness industry honed in on that. And and it's a very, people are very motivated in a very short period of time through hate. And so that's the other thing that the fitness industry focused on was this hype and motivation and inspiration. You know, when, when you look in the mirror and, or you see a picture of yourself and you finally say, that's it, that's enough. I'm, I'm too, I'm too fat or whatever. Right. You have this like temporary state of like self-hate motivation. And so the fitness industry grabs onto that and, and you buy their products. And it's very effective in the short term. And it's much harder to sell the right message. You have to understand how to do it. You have to have more skill and more experience. And so that's just the way it's been. And so when you look at popular fitness media, I mean, it's no wonder people have the wrong idea. It's no wonder people think that an effective workout means that you need to crawl out of the gym or you need to be almost dead, right? You hear people say all the time, oh, what a great workout. What do you mean? Well, I almost threw up. Well, that's right. That's right. not a great workout, right? Nope. It's it's no wonder people think eating right is not a trade off for something better, but rather a sacrifice for something worse. Like yes, you know, I've heard so many people say oh, I, I stopped eating right or I stopped my diet because I just want to enjoy my life. What a strange thing mm-hmm. to hear. You know, nothing will improve the quality of your life in all aspects. Okay, and I'll argue this all day long, and I have the data. The data is very clear. Nothing will improve the quality of your life like being healthy. There isn't right. anything in your life that, that improving your health won't improve. Mental health, obviously physical health. You'll have more energy. You'll be more productive. The studies show this quite clearly. You'll be more innovative. You'll um, make better choices in the market, which drives the market to be healthier as well. You're less prone to anger and anxiety and depression. So it's got tremendous benefits, and yet people say, I stopped because I wanted to enjoy my life. Well, something went wrong there. People understand it the wrong way or applying it the wrong way, and that's you know what I'm, what I'm trying to fix. And it's a big ship, so it's hard to steer and turn, but we're making a bit of an impact. And I, and I talk about this, and I like podcasts because they're long form. This right. is not yeah. something that I can communicate in an Instagram post or a picture or even a, a single article. It's a conversation. I know this because I, I train people for so long. This is a conversation. And, and what we're trying to do is change fundamental behaviors and understandings. This is not a, this doesn't happen overnight. Epiphanies are quite rare. It's a bit of a long process. But if you do it the right way, the success rate, the long term success rate, it's flip that statistic on its head. You, you take 80% of people gain the weight back or get back out of shape or go back to their previous state of health after starting a diet and a fitness program, if done the right way, that statistic, in my experience, flips. 80% are successful long-term. 80% find long-term behaviors and, and develop a good relationship with exercise and nutrition. What does that mean? What does a good relationship mean? Well, 
you don't need to rely on motivation and inspiration when it's something that you truly understand and truly value, where you truly feel and understand how it's impacting your life in a positive way. And, and that sounds simple. It's not. It's actually more complex than the way I'm making it sound. But ultimately, if we can get people to that point, it'll be something that people will do. And they'll do on a, on a relatively consistent basis. So, you know, so that's, that's essentially it. Yeah. And you're, you're dead on there that it's, it's tough. And I, I can see the appeal for the consumer, right? Drink this fat loss smoothie every night before bed and drop 30 pounds in 30 days. Sounds a whole lot better than what maybe somebody else like you and I are pitching, which is, okay, hang on. What we want to do is fundamentally change your relationship with yourself, your body, your nutrition, your exercise, your lifestyle. And what that really means is you changing some behaviors, making small steps, right? We're not trying to build the, the room in a day or anything, but making these small lifestyle changes that are permanent. And it's coming from a place, to your point, not from security or guilt or hate, but from a place of self-love and self-respect, self-care. And when we flip it around that way, I think you're right. That's how we get that long-term success, that long-term body that we're looking for that long-term health that you were talking about, the improved, uh, we will reduce stress, we'll improve libido and, and mood. We'll have stronger bones, be more mobile, et cetera. Yeah. We, so, it, all those but, things. And I, I think we need to give people more takeaways because I, I I'm pretty sure most people have heard this, right? They, they've right, heard the right. benefits. Yep. So that's not new, but what's, what will be new is the approach. And I do think we need to give people some takeaways. And here, here's a couple that I like to communicate to people. One is you should feel better after your workout than you did before your workout. Yep. And this, for yep. some people, this is revolutionary because people think that they should feel worse at the end of the workout. They think that they need to feel like they got beat up or, or took a beating. No, that's, that's not how it works. Now, there are occasions where the super hard workout that tests your mental capabilities or your, your perseverance might have value. Those are so rare though. And really those are more applicable to high level athletes or extreme performance. For the most part, you should, at the end of your workout, feel good. Like you should finish and be like, man, I have more energy. And you, in other words, you should look forward to how you feel at the end, not the exhaustion and the death and the, okay. Cause that means you did it too hard. Exercise needs to be applied appropriately. You know, a lot of people don't realize that exercise is a stress on the body. And this is what signals the body to get stronger, to become more fit, to improve its health. Okay. If that stress surpasses your current body, what I mean by your current body is the context of right now. Okay. If that stress surpasses your body's ability to adapt, then all you're doing is beating yourself up. All you're doing is causing more damage uh, to yourself. Right? So what does that mean? Well, if you're, if you're not exercising now, then it doesn't take much to get the ball rolling. Let me use another example of, of, of what I'm talking about, maybe to illustrate this a little better, right? Your skin's ability to darken when exposed to the sun is another adaptation process. So if you, if you expose your skin to the sun, it gets the, it gets the stress of the UV rays. And then what your body does is it, it, it adapts by darkening your skin so that your skin can handle more sunlight tomorrow or the day after. Okay. Well, if you haven't been out in the sun in a long time, if you've been in your basement for years, it doesn't take much sunlight to do that. And what happens if you get too much sunlight? You get a sunburn. It doesn't make you tan any faster. If anything, it can cause some serious damage. Well, the same thing with exercise. So in order for it to be effective, it must be appropriate. It must be appropriate. Too little causes no, no results or no adaptation. Too much is too much and actually will move you in the wrong direction. In the middle is the perfect dose. What determines the perfect dose? The current context of your body, your lifestyle, all of that stuff, okay? And one way to gauge that is how do you feel at the end of your workout? Do you feel better or do you feel uh, worse? So you should feel better. Uh, here's the second part. We're talking about self-care and self-love and, and you know that's how we should appro approach exercise. Well, you have to view it that way. Because if you go into your workout thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so fat, or you know, I, I, I can't believe I got myself to look this way, and I'm going to go just beat myself up, I'm going to go get this weight off, you've now created a relationship or you're creating a relationship with exercise where it's a punishment. And this is why 
it can feel cathartic to beat yourself up. People don't realize that. But if you're going to the gym because you have, you're disgusted with the way you look and feel, and at the end of it, you feel dead and exhausted, well, you've just punished yourself and you feel deserving of that punishment. And it's actually quite cathartic. I mean, how many times I've, look, I've run gyms for a long time. I've trained lots of people. Do you know how many times people have come in and said things like, oh man, last night I ate way too much pizza. I'm going to go sweat it off. You know, I'm going to yeah, go beat myself up. Now. Yeah. So, so that's what you have to understand. So what you want to do is you want to go to the gym and think to yourself, how can I take care of myself? Like you're taking care of somebody that you actually care about. If you're a parent, this is real easy. Imagine it's your kid. Would you strap your kid to a treadmill and have them run until they threw up? Of course not. If you're a good parent, it's, you know that, that that's not helping them, right? Take care of yourself like someone you care about when you go to the gym, when you try to exercise. So that'll, that'll help as well. Same thing with nutrition. Nutrition needs to be from a standpoint of self-care, not self-hate. If it's self-hate, then nutrition becomes restriction. Okay. In fact, the, the psychological phenomena that I explain that tends to happen is what we tend to do is we tend to divide ourselves into two people, into two identities. We have the, the kid that needs to be tyrannized, which is who you identify with. Like, oh, I'm this kid that just can't control themselves and I ate too much garbage and I ate too much food and I'm too lazy and I don't exercise enough. So that's the kid. And then what you do is you split off and create the tyrannizing adult or dictator who says, you need to not eat that cookie. You need to go work out, right? So yeah, next thing yeah. you know, you're, you know, you're at a party and somebody offers you a slice of pizza and you got the kid and the dictator people living inside you. And what do you say? Oh, no, I can't have that slice of pizza. What do you mean you can't? Who says you can't? You said you can't. Who's that you? That's the dictator. Who's the dictator talking to? That kid that needs to be, needs to be told what to do. It's no wonder we rebel at the end of that process. I mean, nobody is going to live under that tyranny forever. At some point, you think to yourself, like I said earlier, I need to just live my life. I need to just enjoy my life. Right. And yeah, so what do you do? power is not going to get you through the rest of your life, is it? No. And so what do you do? You don't have one slice of pizza. You have a whole pizza. Right? Why not? Yeah. What does that look uh, Yeah. Why did we do that? We rebelled. Rebellion. If you have, look, if you have kids, you know what rebellion looks like. It doesn't look like a little bit. It looks like a lot. You go in the opposite direction, but in a big way, right? Right. So it's what yeah. we're doing to ourselves, right? What you want to do, and if from a self-care standpoint, and there's more to this, and it does take uh, some time, but you want to get to the point where you're at a party and someone says, would you like a slice of pizza? And you say, no, thanks. I don't want it. Or, yes, I think I'll have a slice of pizza, right? What determines whether you have it or not? Well, what determines is what part of your health are you feeding? How are you taking care of yourself? I'll give you two scenarios. One scenario, which is the more common one, which will happen more often, is, well, pizza's not good for me. It's not good for my health. It's not good for my my body, it's not going to make me feel very good. It's not good for my physical health, my mental health, whatever. So I know thanks. I don't, I don't think I want it. By the way, this doesn't mean you don't identify and acknowledge that it's probably going to be a lot of fun to eat that slice of pizza. Just like I could say with all honesty, I've never done this before, but I can say with all honesty that I'm pretty sure doing heroin is going to feel really good. That's why people get addicted to it. Why do I not do heroin? I don't want to. Okay. So for the most part, you may say to yourself, or what you may say to this person is, no, thanks. I don't want it. Now, sometimes, occasionally, the part of you that you may be feeding, the health that you may be feeding, may be the fact that you're with your friends you haven't seen in a long time. And you want to bond over some pizza and a, and, a, and a beer. And that's totally fine. You know what doesn't happen is the binge. What doesn't happen is the eating till you hate yourself type of deal. You have a slice or two and you feel okay. That's the balance that you know, that people, um, are looking for. And there's, there's definitely steps to get there and we can talk about all that. And we can definitely talk about the most effective ways to utilize your time in the gym and the most effective ways to create that balance with nutrition. But what I'm trying to do right now is paint what a good relationship with exercise and nutrition look like. Now, imagine if you're watching or listening to this, that you're in that state of mind, right? Guess what happens? It's a stress-free life where yeah, you actually yeah. eat relatively healthy, you stay relatively active, and it's not this battle or this stressful situation like a lot of people experience when they go on a diet or start exercising. And then you say to yourself or to somebody, hey, why do you exercise and, and why do you, you know, for the most part, eat right? 
because I want to enjoy my life. Yeah, full circle back to that enjoying my life as opposed to I'm giving up on this horrible diet, this obnoxious thing I'm supposed to do or this, this right. grueling workout that I despise. I'm giving up on it so I can enjoy my life. You've just flipped that script completely on its head. So you had mentioned the best way to get there, and I definitely want to go there, but let's set the stage here. So we know that today 60% of Americans have a chronic disease, 40% have two or more. Half of us are on prescription meds. I think it's north of 70% now or overweight, obese, or morbidly obese. And one of my recent guests on this podcast noted that we that's become normalized. We're no longer shocked when we hear these kinds of statistics, right? This is our new normal. And I think we've you've just described pretty well kind of why this is, right? I think that the health and nutrition, exercise and nutrition industry has let us down a little bit. So Sal, if if I'm getting well-meaning advice from my doctor, because I go in and say I've got I'm overweight and I've got pre pre-diabetes, my cholesterol is up there and gonna put me on meds, the doctor's liable to say something like, Hey, you should eat less and exercise more. A very vague prescription, but very often the way that is applied is kind of like what we were talking about, right? It's going to be, let's calorie restrict and hey, let's get you on that cardio machine, get on a treadmill, let's do a stair stepper or something like that, right? What's wrong with that system? Because clearly it's not working, not in the context we're talking about for long-term change. No, it's 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 a, it's far more complex than that. We're, we're not, so here's the deal. Humans are, we are behavior-based creatures. Okay, we'd like to think that we operate through pure logic, you know, objective logic, but it doesn't work that way. Nope. I mean, obviously, right? We're, yep. Yep. we're, we're behavior based. So, so, okay, uh, logically, move more, eat less. Yes, that must work. You know, here's your health and here's what it's going to be if you do this. Well, it obviously, it doesn't work because we're, we're totally disregarding the fact that we're uh, behavior based animals. And I do want to make this comment about obesity. Contrary to popular media, nothing, and this is now, this is for the people who may be in the fitness and health space who are watching this, okay? And, and maybe people who aren't might find this interesting, but it's very true. And I'll challenge anybody to, to dispute this, but nothing threatens modern societies like poor health, like obesity and the poor health that results from it. Nothing, nothing comes close. Nothing kills as many people. That's a fact. Right, nothing right causes as many chronic diseases. That's a fact. Nothing contributes to poor mental health as much as obesity and, and the poor health that follows. That's a fact. Nothing results in less innovation and less productivity than our poor health. We act differently. We make different choices. We view the world differently. Remember, our bodies and our brains, because our brains are part of our bodies, which then extends to the mind a bit, right? Our bodies, brains, and minds are filters for the world around us, okay? If this filter is inflamed in poor health, you are going to view things very differently. You're going to view things in a very – negatives are going to feel much more negative. Positives are going to feel much less positive. So it costs us tremendous amounts of money as a society as well. In fact, nothing threatens to bankrupt us like our poor health, okay? So this is a – this is the existential threat, okay? And I know popular media likes to point to all kinds of other things, but if you look at the numbers, it's actually that right there. So this is a big problem that we need to tackle, and we've been doing um, a terrible job. Okay, so let's talk about the move more, eat less advice. I mean, that's like somebody coming to me saying, hey, I'm bankrupt, and I, I, I'm having trouble feeding my kids and paying my bills, and then I say, oh, you know, save more money. Make more money, save more right, money. Right? right. Well, okay, thanks, Einstein. <laughs> There's more to that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Than, than just doing that. So so let's talk about that for a second. First off, let's talk about the burn calorie model with exercise. Let's tackle that first. Right, right. So it is true that in order to lose weight, we have to we have to create what's called an energy imbalance. Okay. So what does that mean? That and this is a law of thermodynamics. So this is a law of physics, you can't get around it. What it means is you need to burn more than you take in, or to put it differently, take in less than you burn. When that energy imbalance happens, your body needs to find alternative sources of energy. If it's not getting it from food and you're burning it, then ideally it'll tap into your body fat, and this is what causes weight loss, okay? 
So that's true. So regardless of your diet, I don't care how healthy your diet is. I don't care what it's made up of. And yes, it's more complex than this, but this fact remains. You have to create that energy imbalance in order to cause any weight loss. Okay, so what we've done is we've taken a very complex issue and simplified it to the extreme to what I just said. And then what we did is we said, okay, well, less calories in, more calories out. Let's look at the calories out side of that equation. Let's look at exercise because you know you through activity we burn more calories, right? Let's look at exercise modalities and let's rank them in order of calorie burn. That's going to be the value. The number one most valuable form of exercise is the one that burns the most calories. Now, I understand the rationale. Okay, I get the rationale. But it, it completely ignores the most important aspect uh, of exercise, which is how does each form of exercise get my body to adapt and change? And then what does that mean? They ignore that. They just look at the calorie burn. And the problem with the calorie burn aspect of it is when you ignore how your body adapts, then you ignore what happens downstream of that. And then you you end up with uh, a scenario where your body's burning less calories than before because of adaptations. And so let's, let's talk about that for a second. So if if we just looked at exercise and valued each form by its calorie burn, then the number one form of exercise would be cardiovascular activity. Just go and move as much as possible. Running, cycling, swimming, jumping jacks in place. Doesn't matter. Just move as much as possible because that burns the most calories in an hour, which is true. Okay, Running in an hour burns more calories than any other form of exercise. Uh, yoga or uh, strength training right? or Pilates burns more than that. Okay. Here's the problem with that. We're ignoring that adaptation process. Let's look at the adaptations. Your body adapts to exercise in ways that make you better at that form of exercise. So think of it that way. So if you go for a run around the block and that's really hard for you, your body will start to adapt to get it so that you can run two blocks and then three blocks and so on. So let's dive a little deeper. What does your body need to do to itself in order to do that? Well, it needs a lot of stamina and endurance, but it doesn't need much strength. Oh, and by the way, because we're burning so many calories while we're doing this form of activity, your body's always trying to become more efficient with its calorie burn. It's always, think of it this way. If I had a super advanced artificially intelligent car that molded itself to my driving habits, if I drove for, you know, 300 miles a day at 30 miles an hour, how would my car mold itself? Well, it would turn into a one-cylinder engine or a hybrid. It, would conser- it wouldn't need a lot of power. It wouldn't need to burn lots of, en- of gas. It would conserve energy and become this super-efficient car, right? That's what happens to your body when you just do lots of cardio, especially when you cut your calories. So what happens is you, f- you start off with this process of doing lots of cardio. You burn more calories, but eventually your body learns how to burn less calories. Part of this is through the paring down of muscle and studies will show this when you combine because muscle is very very expensive tissue right right it it costs a lot of energy so and we see this in studies lots of cardiovascular activity in combination with calorie restriction results in muscle loss fat loss but also muscle loss and many studies show almost half the weight that you lose comes from muscle so you lose 10 pounds four to five pounds of it is muscle four to five you know five six pounds of it is coming from body fat what does that look like? Well, you're a smaller, roughly similar body fat percentage version of yourself. So you're smaller, same flabbiness, if you will. But you now burn less calories. So now your body's learning to operate on less calories. So you're saying we're metabolically adapting by slowing our metabolism with this constant cardio. With this constant cardio in combination with calorie restriction. With the calorie deficit, right. Yeah. So what happens is you, you lose some weight and then you plateau. So it's like, right. oh my God, I lost 10 pounds. Nothing is happening anymore. What do I got to do? Oh, I know. I'll cut my calories more. I'll do more cardio. And then I lost another five pounds. Oh, my God, I plateaued again. Oh, I guess I got to cut my calories more, do more cardio. This is this unsustainable approach, okay? Great, you lost 30 pounds, but now you're doing five days a week of activity and you're eating 1,200 calories a day, okay? Now, not really lifetime sustainable, is it? No, not when you live in modern societies. You're surrounded by easily accessible food. 
we and we'll get to nutrition here in just a second, but you know, we do so many things with food. We celebrate with food, we have meetings with food, you know, I have access to all kinds of different ethnic varieties of food. You know, so I'm going to survive off 1200 calories for the rest of my life and have to do 5 days a week of of exercise and I'm not a fitness fanatic. Now I can do it because I love fitness, it's my career. Most people, I'm going to tell you this right now, most people if they do a damn good job of developing good behaviors will develop a consistent two- to three-day-a-week routine. We're not going to get them to do four or five days a week. It's not going to happen. They're not fanatics, and right. that's okay. Right. That's totally okay, right? So unsustainable, not going to work, and it's no wonder people stop and then gain the weight back. So let's talk about a much more sustainable approach just from a mechanistic aspect. Rather than looking at exercise as just a calorie burn, let's view it through the adaptation lens, okay? We talked about met- metabolic adaptation. We talked about the metabolism slowing down. What gets the metabolism to speed up? Because wouldn't that be great, right? Like if I could snap my fingers, if I could snap my fingers and do one thing that would solve the obesity epidemic right now, what I would do is I would boost everybody's metabolism by 50%. If I just did that right now, everybody would lose, they would live the same lifestyle, same crappy diet, same inactivity, same everything, but they'd lose weight, right? Right. And so for, just take a minute and tell folks that might not understand when you say, okay, I'm going to speed up your metabolism. They're going to lose weight. Talk a little bit about how that works because we're getting ready to get to talk about building up our metabolism here and ways to do that and do it sustainably. But how does that work? Yes. So let's talk about the form of exercise that does that the best. Strength training. Okay. Nothing has a positive in this context case effect on the metabolism like strength training. Strength training the adaptation that comes from strength training is strength and muscle. Now, on its face, muscle alone is very expensive tissue. So if you have gained five pounds of muscle, you're going to burn a lot more calories because to maintain that muscle requires a lot of energy in comparison to other types of tissue in the body, especially body fat. Body fat doesn't require much at all to maintain. Muscle requires uh, quite a bit more calories. So building muscle on its own, speeds up the metabolism. By the way, muscle is very dense, and I'm saying this because someone might be thinking, I don't want to get bigger. Okay. If you all, if everybody gained 10 pounds of muscle right now, you would barely notice in terms of size. You know what you would notice? That you feel firm. Yeah. Okay? It yeah. takes up about roughly two-thirds of the space that body fat does. So if you lost 10 pounds of fat, gained 10 pounds of muscle, you'd lose about one maybe a little less than one third of your size, right? So think about it that way. So it's not, you're not going to get big from five pounds of muscle, but you get this, you'll feel tighter and you'll have right. a much, you'll faster, look a little more defined. And you have a faster metabolism. Yeah. It also alters your hormones or organizes your hormones in a very youthful way. Okay. So, and here's why. What, one of the first steps that your body takes when it's trying to adapt is it organizes its hormones in a way to do so. So if your body receives a signal through strength training and you feed yourself appropriately and it says, okay, we need to build muscle. What it does is it takes your hormones and it says, okay, guys, let's organize ourselves in a way because hormones signal the body. Okay. Let's organize ourselves in a way to build muscle. What does that look like? In men, it's higher testosterone. In women, it's more balanced estrogen and progesterone. You develop better insulin sensitivity. In fact, nothing improves insulin sensitivity like building muscle. Nothing comes close. There's studies on severely obese individuals who lost no weight. They just gained a few pounds of muscle. And you see these incredible improvements in insulin sensitivity. And it's because muscle is very insulin sensitive. It also serves as a, another storage bank for carbohydrates. So uh, you have more capability to store carbohydrates when you have more muscle. You know, growth hormone goes up. Cortisol levels become more appropriate, right? The stress hormone. So you you develop a youthful, a a more youthful hormone profile through the process of building muscle. Does that help with fat loss and muscle gain? Absolutely. I mean, if you give men, I'll put it to you this way. If you just give men testosterone or men and women, if you put men and women on hormone therapy to mimic youthful levels of hormones without changing anything else in their lifestyle, you'll see them get leaner. Okay. Well, your body will do that naturally through proper strength training. Also, this is something else, and this is for people who are the, who, who tend to be the sticklers on, on research. Cause I'll hear people say, well, you know, 
Studies show that one pound of muscle only gains an additional, you know, burns an additional 10 calories. It's not, it's not that simple. You have a, a range of calories that you'll burn with the same lean body mass. Okay, so without even gaining extra lean body mass or losing extra lean body mass, your body can become more or less efficient. What tells it to do to do become more efficient or less efficient? How it's signaled. If you tell your body, we need strength, we need muscle, and you feed your body appropriately, so you're not over-dieting, right? Your body feels like it can become less efficient and burn more calories. If you restrict your calories too much and you work yourself in a way that tells your body to lose muscle, then your body will become less efficient with calories. So the muscle building process on its own speeds up the metabolism. And I've look, I've done this for decades. I've gotten people's metabolisms routinely 500 calories faster, 800 calories faster, 1,000 calories faster. I mean, five, look, let's just talk about 500 extra calories. If you were burning 500 extra calories a day doing nothing else, that's equivalent to like, for most people, a two hours of of cardio activity. So imagine if you were doing, you were burning the calories of two hours of, of cardio, but you didn't do the two hours of cardio, right? Right. Like yeah. how, how much more sustainable is that? And then here's the other part. Strength training is beautiful because you don't need to do it all the time. If the value of your exercise is how many calories you burn while you do it, well, then you just got to do it all the time because that's the value. If you don't do it, you don't get the value, right? If the value of the exercise is in the adaptation, I don't need to do it all the time. I just need to do it in a way that elicits that adaptation in the best way possible. Well, guess what? For most people, okay, I'm not talking about advanced fitness fanatics or bodybuilders or anything like that. I'm talking about the average person who just wants to be fit and healthy. For most people, that's two days a week. Two days a week, a full body strength training routine. You know, if, if after they do it for three or four years consistently, they can add a third day, right? That's it. More than that, not necessary. And in fact, most people will probably not benefit more from doing There's a lot you could do with three days a week or two days a week of, of proper strength training. That's beautiful. That's a wonderful. That's a beautiful prescription, isn't it? Yeah. When you're talking two to three days a week of and 45 minutes to an hour, you're not even talking about hours of work here, right? That's a wonderful so, feature of strength training. Yes, it is. And let's, let's just take an example here. Let's say Mrs. Jones, she's 57 years old and she's 20 pounds overweight. She's trying to get back to her healthy weight and maybe she's lost and gained this 20 pounds by this time in her life a dozen or more times. By the time she gets to us, she's on the cardio machines five days a week. She's in this calorie deficit. When she comes in, then what you're saying is the first thing we want to do is restore her metabolism. We're yeah. going to, she wants to lose weight, but she might be surprised when we say, okay, pick up a barbell and eat more, right? Because what we want to do is to restore this metabolism. She may have heard that maybe her metabolism is broken. It's not broken. It's just adapted to what she's doing. Her body's seeking homeostasis. It says, okay, fine. If we're only eating 1,200 calories and we're doing this much work, fine. We'll adapt to that. That's our new baseline. But to your point, if she's eating 1,300 calories a day and we can get her to 2,100 calories a day and make that her new normal, right? Her new homeostasis, get her metabolically adapted to that. Then when we put her into a fat loss phase, she's going to lose weight very quickly, right? Because we've prioritized this strength training. We've probably pulled most, if not all of those cardio days out for her. And that's a much different prescription than probably what she's heard most of her life. Is that fair? Oh, totally fair. Uh, we're, look, we're, do you want to lose weight and gain it back or do you want to keep it off forever? Right? We have to set the stage. Yeah. And we have to set your body up in a way to maintain this. And we have to consider all of those things. And what it looks like is kind of what you said, right? We're going to come in. We're going to feed you appropriately. Right. Make sure you eat adequate protein. We're going to slowly increase your calories to feed the muscle that we're going to put on your body through strength training. Through that process initially, you'll probably notice no weight loss on the scale. But you will notice some body composition changes. Mm -hmm, in other mm -hmm. words, you'll get smaller because you lost some fat and built some muscle, so you'll feel different. I, I used to have clients do this all the time. It's like we'd, we would lose no weight on the scale, but they'd come to me and be like, my friends keep telling me I look like I lost 10 pounds. Well, yep, yep. it's because you, you look different, right? So, so that'll start to happen, and then you'll start to see a snowball effect. As the metabolism kicks in, fat loss starts to happen, and then it starts to speed up, and then you get this scenario where your client comes to you and says, this is really weird. I keep getting leaner. And I don't know how it's happening. I'm only right, working out a couple right. days a week and I'm eating more food. And this is really strange. It's like, look, we're, we're working with your body, not against your body. But you have to set the stage. You know, it's like, it's like, you, it's like you want to build a house 
and you hire a bunch of workers and they don't do anything about, they don't build a foundation at all. They just throw up a bunch of two by fours and, and a bunch of, you know, sheetrock. So you see a house kind of being built and you're like, okay, this is happening really fast. Like, do you want to go live in that house? I mean, you know, the, the wind blows the wrong way. Um, that done, house is, yeah. is going to topple gonna over fall. and kill you. Right. So you build that foundation and you, and you start to do it the right way. And then it builds sustainability. It, it feels better too. It feels a lot better because the other model of the pair muscle down, burn more, eat less, it actually organizes your hormones in a, in a, in the opposite way, right? Cortisol goes up in men. You see testosterone drop yep. quite reliably yep. because your body has to, in order to get you to pair muscle down and you start to feel worse and you're putting in a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of discipline to eat as little as you are and you're just like like i said earlier i just want to live my life i don't want to do yeah, this anymore yeah. by the way for people who don't understand just how powerful our bodies can adapt or how far metabolic adaptation can go there's very well done studies on modern hunter gatherers so these are people that live the way we lived 50,000 years ago. There's, there was one study in particular done on a tribe in northern Tanzania called the Hadza tribe. And they don't have any modern technology. They don't have phones and electricity. And they hunt by the way we probably hunted where they'll, you know, they'll stalk an animal, they'll throw a spear at it, and then run after it for 8 to 10 miles until it gets exhausted. So that's a lot of activity. They're gathering. They're moving way more than we are. And Scientists went down and they said, let's figure out how many calories they're burning every day. And they used very sophisticated metabolic uh, testing. So there was no estimates. They literally were able to measure their metabolism. And what they found was that the Hadza tribes people burned roughly the same amount of calories as the modern, you know, Western couch potato. Why? Because we would have never survived in nature if our bodies just allowed us to burn 10,000 calories, we wouldn't be able to find 10,000 calories worth of food. So what type of activity the had said, you know, what do, they, what do they do most of the time? Lots of cardiovascular activity. And they don't eat much because food is scarce. They're hunter-gatherers. So their metabolisms, even though they're doing all this activity, they're not burning more calories than we are. Now, I'm not saying that they're not healthier. They're definitely healthier because of their activity and the types of foods that they're eating. But yeah. I'm talking about from a metabolic standpoint. So... It can adapt. And I've seen this many times. A very obese individual comes in. They're doing, look, there was a study done on the Biggest Loser contestants. So for anybody who's not familiar, this is a, a show. It's quite popular. They take various obese individuals, and the goal is to see who can lose the most weight. And they beat the crap out of them. They do tons and tons of activity and mostly cardio or cardio with weights. They restrict their calories. Well, when you follow them after the, the show, you see that these people's metabolisms are down to a crawl. 1,200 calories a day. They got to eat to maintain it. They got to do all kinds of activity, right? Because they started out yeah. the wrong way. So it's no wonder we fail. Yeah, that's a, that's a losing proposition. And, and back to the Mrs. Jones who comes in and she, her goal is weight loss. I think that when we apply this prescription that you're talking about, we rebuild her metabolism, we get her strength training a couple of days a week, and then we put her in that fat loss phase and we, we get to that ultimate body composition that she's looking for. I think what she finds, and I hear this a lot, is wow, all of a sudden I, I just feel so much better. I have so much more energy and my mobility is better. And holy moly, that knee tweak or that back tweak that I've just figured that's just the way the rest of my life was going to be because that's what happens when you age, that's gone. And my cognition and mood is better. And I, I just think that there's this cascade of events of being a healthier human that come along with responsible long-term weight loss that we just miss when we're in that constant calorie deficit or that yo-yo diet and gaining the weight and losing the weight, gaining the weight back and losing the weight, right? So I love that you've got this emphasis on strength training to build muscle. I think it was Dr. Gabriel Lyon who said that muscle is the organ of longevity. And she talks a lot about, you know, the, the importance of type two muscle, specifically for people over 50, right? Maintaining that. And you're not going to build type two muscle or fast twitch muscle fibers by doing lo a lot of cardio. In fact, just the opposite. We've said that that's actually catabolic and it's going to. A lot of people don't know this, but one of the, the, the best predictors of longevity, one of the, one of the, there's a single metric that'll predict longevity better than almost any other single metric. And that is a simple grip strength yeah, test. Yeah. They've, they've actually compared that to blood pressure, cholesterol, to all these other single metrics, and it's a better predictor. Yeah. Strength yeah. is very important. Why? Because of what it means. Not just that you're stronger, but all those other things I talked about and more right. that are related to more strength. You know, we talk about Alzheimer's and dementia. This is a, this is a, a growing issue. 
you know, many researchers call dementia and Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. Yeah, I've heard that. And we know that when we put people who have Alzheimer's and dementia on a ketogenic diet where we completely cut out carbohydrates, we see this kind of temporary improvement in cognition. Now, it's not a cure. It's kind of a Band-Aid. But that's because their bodies have really not been utilizing glucose or been able to utilize it very well. So you develop these kind of issues. In fact, strength training is one of the only non-medical interventions that's been shown to stop the progression of the beta amyloid plaque that build up that results in or that causes that we think causes the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Why? I talked about it earlier. Insulin sensitivity, tremendous improvements in insulin sensitivity just from gaining a little bit of muscle. You don't need to look like a bodybuilder. You don't need to be extreme. It's really just some, and it makes a, 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 a tremendous difference. And again, you don't need to do it much when you want to reap those, those benefits. Now I know it's more complex than what we're talking about. There's more kind of moving pieces, but I do want to say this, and I think this helps people understand that what you're doing is first off, you need to apply it appropriately. Okay. So don't get stuck in the more is better mentality. More is not better. More is worse. The right amount is best. So remember that first off. And, and of course, your fitness level, the context of your life is what determines that. Am I overstressed? Did I get good sleep, bad sleep? How do I feel? And how fit am I and experienced am I? That'll help dictate. By the way, you should not be sore after your workouts. I know this, people are minds are getting blown right now, right, but right. a little bit of soreness is fine, but getting really sore means you're right. So I don't care what you did. I don't care if you only did one set of body weight squats. If you got super sore, it was too much. You, you, you overdid it for your body. So that's something to focus on. Here's something else. This process needs to be done piece by piece. And the, the path looks a little different from person to person. So here's how you tackle that. First off, if you're just about to get started, you're probably in a motivated state of mind. So I need you to, what I need you to do, if you're watching this or listening to this, is place yourself in a non-motivated state of mind. So in other words, how would I view what I'm about to do under normal circumstances? Now, why is that important? Because when you're motivated, you don't need help. Like, I've never had to tell somebody to eat, you know, eat right or be consistent with exercise when they're motivated. It's when they're not motivated. Why is this important? Because nobody's motivated all the time. It's a state of, you know, I guess you could compare it to like happiness or sadness or, you know, uh, it just, it, it comes and goes. So if you rely on motivation, then what will end up happening is you'll work out sometimes and you won't, you'll eat right. It's sometimes a fickle friend to be sure. Yeah. yeah. So take yourself out of that state of mind and, and ask yourself the following question. What change can I make now that is challenging? It has to be challenging because otherwise it won't have any meaning to you but realistic forever. So what can I do now that is going gonna, is gonna to be a little challenging, but I also feel pretty confident that I'll be able to maintain for the rest of my life? That's where you start. And I don't care what it is. It can literally be, I'm going to walk for five minutes once a week. You know, I mean, I've had clients start this process and just drink a glass of water you know, every day. That was where they started. Once that change feels like habit, feels like behavior, then do that again. What's the next thing that I can do that is challenging yet realistic forever? Now, here's what's going to happen. Each step gets bigger and bigger naturally as you start to get the ball rolling. And it does sound like a slow process, but it actually speeds up faster than you realize. And the odds of permanent success are really, really high if you do it that way. And so you end up making these little changes that become bigger changes. And before you know it, you've developed these behaviors and this lifelong, healthy, maintainable, sustainable, you know, relationship to exercise and nutrition. I'll, I'll tell you a story of a client I've shared before on my show because she was such a perfect, perfect example of this. When I had my wellness studio, I was about half a mile away from a major hospital. And so at one point, one of the doc, one of the surgeons that worked there came to my studio. I started training them. And then before you know it, they were referring other doctors. And at one point, you know, more than half my clients were these doctors and surgeons. And they saw the value in what I did and my approach. And none of them are fitness fanatics, but they all developed this good relationship with exercise. And then they started referring me to their patients, which was a huge honor. You know, when, I, when you're a trainer and cancer surgeon recommends you a patient, it's a huge honor. And so they started doing this because they could see the value in, in my approach. And I remember there was one woman 
was referred to me by one of my surgeon clients who was just that. She was a cancer survivor. And this doctor kept telling her, hey, you got to see this, this guy. He's a trainer and he does a really good job. And so finally this woman walks in and literally says, Dr. So-and-so recommended me. I don't want to be here. So here's, before you say anything, here's what this is. These are going to be my, these are, this is my standards here. These are, this are my, what I want to do here's with the this. ground rules. Yeah. Here's my ground rules. I'm not going to work out more than one, one day a week with you. I'm not going to do any exercise on my own and I'm not going to change my nutrition. And I said, okay. That's where we'll start. That's where we're going to start. And it's much more than you're doing now. I think we can go pretty far with that, which took her aback. She thought I was going to, you know, motivate her, inspire her to come more. And I said, no, let's do that. Let's start once a week. And so that's what we did. And I did this approach. What's one change you can make that's challenging yet realistic forever? And we started that way. And it started with one day a week with me. That's where we started. Then slowly she came to me and she said, hey, Sal, can you show me like an exercise or two that I can do on my own? at home when I have time. Now I knew this would eventually happen, but I hide my excitement. I don't want to act shocked. So I'm like, absolutely. Let me give you these two exercises. And then she did that. And then she came to me and she said later on, Hey Sal, do you have room in your schedule to see me another day a week? Yeah, absolutely. Let me check. And she came and she saw me twice a week. And then, Hey Sal, can you give me three more exercises that I can do on my own? Absolutely. Let's do that. And then, you know, I know I don't, I, I told you I did, I like, I was really hard about not wanting to touch my diet, but you know, I think, I, I think I might want to reduce my sugar. So do you think you can help me with that? I said, absolutely. Let's start with this and then give her some, some ideas. Well, anyway, over the course of two years, this woman became a fitness fanatic, literally became, she loved it. Yeah, this is, yeah. she hated it. She hated it when she first started, couldn't stand it, literally tried to talk me out of training her when she first came in. But through this process, and by the way, I'm still in touch with her. She still does it regularly. So this is now, uh, I don't know, this is maybe 13 years later. But yeah, she she slowly applied this process. And over the course of two years, got to the point where she was exercising, you know, relatively regularly, five days a week, two or three days a week were really structured. The other two or th- three days a week were just mostly, you know, doing hikes and stuff like that. Her diet really became much better. She reduced her sugar intake, increased her protein intake, and the the changes were profound. But what was most exciting was that they were permanent. They were permanent. This is something that she's going to do. And she loved it. Yeah, She yeah. loved it. So that's the that you want to have. And you want to do it that way. And that's the only way it's going to work forever. There is no, don't wait for the epiphany. You know, so many people have these crazy events happen where they have a double bypass surgery or this crazy health scare yeah and that yeah. doesn't work to That's get them the to yeah. and that doesn't work to change their you know i know people who smoke cigarettes after you right. know having fought after cancer having cancer or, yeah right so don't wait for that it's not going to happen what i'm talking about is the way to, and understand that you are a behavior-based emotional uh human so you have to work with that and slowly work with that and again there's a little more that goes into it like i'll, I'll give one nutrition tip just one because nutrition can be a little complex, but I'll give one that I think helps a lot. There are general rules that are true in nutrition, but there's so much individual variance that we have to consider what food means to you, when you tend to overeat, what causes cravings and how you feel around that and that kind of stuff. And one thing that can throw a wrench in all of it is if you eat foods that are engineered to make you overeat. It is very hard to go through this process if you're eating foods that have literally been engineered to have drug-like effects on you. So one thing you can do that will help is to avoid heavily processed foods. Not necessarily because they're inherently less healthy, although they are for the most part, but rather because they most of the money and research that goes into those foods goes into the science of how to make them so irresistible right, right. that you literally overeat them, okay? And studies show this. Heavily processed foods result in about 600 more calorie consumption on a daily basis, which is huge. That's huge. Right. Yeah. So Add that up over a week or a year for yeah, that matter. Yeah. I'll, I'll illustrate it further, okay? If I took five large, plain, baked, right. or boiled potatoes, plain, no salt, no butter, nothing, and I put five of them in front of you, and I, said, and I said, eat these in 40 minutes, right? 
it that's would be a tough task. I'm not sure most people could do that. Oh, you gag after two or three of them. Uh, sure. I, I can't do this anymore. You really have to force yourself. Right, if I gave right. you a large family size bag of potato chips, I'm on it. which has about that many potatoes, actually nope, has more nope. calories because can, of the oil. I can do that. Yes, yeah. you can. That's the power of these of these engineered foods. So it's really hard. It's going to be really hard for you to move through this process if you're constantly getting hijacked by these foods that you know, these scientists that work on engineering these foods, they're really smart right, and they're really right. good at what they do. So if you could just avoid those, that'll make the process much easier. Yeah, that's a great tip. And to your point, we're all bio-individuals and nutrition can be, nutritional science certainly is a, a very complex subject, but one thing that applies to all of us across the board is just to avoid that, those, that very heavily ultra-processed foods, right? And eat more real foods. All right. Well, Sal, We've talked a lot about the benefits of strength training. We've talked about why maybe that traditional prescription of eat less and move more is maybe not in our best interest for long-term health and body change. What are some great resources we can give folks? So I know at the in the intro, we mentioned your book, The Resistance Training Revolution. We talked about your your MAPS programs. Talk to us a little bit about somebody listening to this says, okay, I've been doing this all wrong. I'm ready to make some changes. What are some good resources? Because, I mean, other than walking into a gym for the first time, for those of us over 50, that can be a pretty intimidating totally. task right there alone. What do I do when I get to the gym? How do I structure this? You've got some great resources for that. Why don't you take a few minutes and talk to us about maybe getting started with this, some kind of a program here? Yeah. So first, I want to say this. There, when it comes to what we're talking about, there is no greater, more valuable investment than a really good coach or trainer because nothing's going to match that. Having someone there who's good, okay, who can guide you along the way through this process, there is nothing that, there is no book, there is no, you know, piece of information that I can share with you. No YouTube video. There, that'll right? come close. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nothing's yeah. going to come close. Now, if you're not ready for that, then there are some pretty good resources. My podcast, you know, obviously we're, we're experienced trainers and we communicate, you know, how to approach this in, like I said, in very effective ways. So it's Mind Pump. We have a YouTube channel. I'm sure your podcast does this very well. I've met you a couple times, and I know you know where you've where you've learned some of your stuff, and I the sources are really good. So you probably do the same thing. So those are great. When you walk into the gym, here's a couple tips that'll help. Don't go, here's one. Don't go in there to work out. I know that sounds crazy, but don't go in there to work out. Go in there to practice the skill of exercise. Okay, so that'll serve you far better, especially in the long term, than going to work out. What does that mean? That means that. If I go in there, I don't think to myself, I need to work out my legs. I think I'm going to practice the skill of squatting or I'm going to practice the skill of lunging. Why? Well, if I go in there to work out, I'm, I'm more likely to overdo it, which is very common. And I am also disregarding the value of the skill of the exercise itself. A well-done squat is worth a tremendous amount in terms of results and value. A poorly done squat is worth nothing more than maybe the calories you burn while you do it, and the risk of injury goes through the roof. Okay, so you're not doing much when you do these exercises in ways that are not effective. So go in there and think to yourself, I'm going to practice the following exercises. Here's some of the best ones, okay? Squatting, deadlifting, horizontal pressing, so a bench press would be good, for example. Rowing would be good. Overhead pressing is really good. Split stance exercises like lunges are really good. You know, various forms of crunches done properly can be really good. So those, and those are some basic, and by the way, the ones I just named, if you just did those and you're looking for just general fitness, sure, you're fine. You can practice those, those pound, for your whole life. Movements, yeah. yeah, you can practice those for the rest of your life and do uh, really, really well. So do that. Do not aim to get sore. If you get really sore, you overdid it. You feel a little bit of soreness, the kind where you have to kind of stretch to identify, then you're okay. No soreness is totally fine. If you're getting stronger, if you feel like you're getting better at the exercise, in other words, your form feels better, your your technique feels better, you feel more stable, you're moving in the right, you're moving in the right direction. You should feel better after your workout than you did uh, before, like I said earlier. So there, there's the uh, the exercise portion. With nutrition, just avoid heavily processed foods. That alone usually causes people to lose weight by itself. Okay, that by itself does it. If you want to take another step, aim for at least half your body weight in grams of protein. 
if you could get your body weight in protein even better. Okay, why? Protein is just plain and simple, two reasons. It builds more muscle, which we talked about earlier, why that's a great thing. And also because nothing, nothing produces satiety like protein. So if you want to get, you know, control your cravings, your appetite, that makes a big difference. It also controls blood sugar and insulin very well. Aim for the protein, that protein target, and eat that first. So whatever meal you have in front of you, let's say you figure, you know, that you need to eat, let's say you're a 130-pound woman and you want to aim for, let's say, 90 grams of protein, which is, which would be great. So you're like, okay, I need 30 grams of protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When you get your breakfast, eat the 30 grams of protein first, then you can move on to whatever. When you get your lunch, eat the protein first and whatever. That controls insulin, blood sugar better, it controls cravings better, and it results in uh, lower um, calorie consumption. And that's it, really. Those basic things that I just said would, would do more <laughs> to help people than a lot of the other garbage that's out there. But if you can afford... To hire a coach, and I'll tell you this right now, there's nothing that'll that'll pay you back dividends like hiring a really good trainer or coach. Like really, like I mean, even if it was just a few hundred bucks, it's uh, it's worth its weight in gold. If you could do that, do that because that'll 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 give you the, the highest odds of success. One hundred percent with you there. Hiring a, a fitness coach and then later a nutrition coach were literally life transforming for me as well. So, folks, if you want to go to SilverEdgePartners.com. You can take a look at all of the MAPS fitness products. So, Sal, how many, gosh, how many programs do you guys have now? You've got programs for basically everybody from the brand new newbie to the really advanced athlete, right? Yeah, right? good question. It's got to be 13 or so. Yeah, we at the, least. The, the, the beginner, beginner program is called MAPS Starter. So if you're just getting started, you can do MAPS Starter, or you can get my book, The Resistance Training Revolution. In there, I have some really good starter strength training right. workouts. So, yeah, if you folks aren't ready to invest in a coach right away, there's a, at least you have a blueprint for how to, how to structure your workouts. Yes. And certainly on the nutrition, you guys also have a, the intuitive nutrition guide. And we talk about nutrition all the time on this podcast. But really, if you're prioritizing that protein and you're eating primarily whole foods, you're head and shoulders above most folks. So, Sal, as we wrap up here, what's next for you? Oh, geez. Well, we're, we're really trying to continue to, to get our voices out there. And, and the, the main people, and we, we, we make this known, the most important people that we're trying to influence are other coaches and trainers, uh, mainly because, look, we were, we were trainers for, uh, I was a trainer for over two decades, and um, nobody impacts people in the right way, in, in lifelong ways, like a good trainer or a good coach. So we know if we can impact coaches and trainers, that the downstream effects are going to be um, absolutely profound. So we continue to try to to do that and continue to grow that. So that's really always a goal. And just really grow our voices as much as possible and try to get other people to either follow suit or or seek out to do things in similar ways or the right ways. And slowly but surely, I think, because really the only industry that has the answers to solve these chronic health issues it's not the medical industry. They, they don't have the answers for chronic health yet. Maybe they will invent something in the future. But really right now it's the fitness and health space. So just continue to grow that so we can start to steer that ship in the right direction. Yeah, and for folks listening, if you're I, I, probably most of you out there are not coaches, um, you're more consumers or just interested in fitness. Mind Pump is still a, a great resource, that podcast. Uh, it's daily. So you guys have got a ton of content. You can get all that you want. And I will drop, I'll drop all of Sal's contact information as well as the uh, link to the book, the, to the podcast, all of that into the show notes here. So Sal, how can people connect with you? What's the best way? Uh, well, obviously you can find me on the podcast or on YouTube yep. and I'm on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. That would be the other way, but otherwise you can email us at mindpumpmedia.com. Right on. Well, Sal, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing all of your wisdom, your knowledge, and clearly your passion for this. And I wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you having me on. Okay, folks, that's our show for this week. I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. You can find all of the links to the resources we discussed in this episode over at silveredgefitness.com slash episode 124. 
And you can continue the conversation over there as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on today's show. I also want to let you know that if you've enjoyed this podcast, I have other free resources over at silveredgefree.com. I just recently added a guide on optimizing your metabolism, and that's been very popular. And just a couple weeks ago, I added a guide to help you get your first pull up in six weeks. So feel free to head over there and download anything that looks useful to you and your health and wellness journey. I really appreciate you spending your time with me today. And until next time, stay strong. 